Hello, I'm Nathan Gardner. Today, the 14th of January, 2013, I am joined by Professor James J. Fox. We are here in the Australian National University Media Studio as part of the School of History's Summer Scholar Project, a project that seeks to record the history of the university through the voices of the people that have made it the university that it is today. The project's supervisor is Dr. Paul Arthur, and its media producer is Jamie Kidston. I'd like to welcome you, Jim Fox. Cool. Glad to be here. Now, if I could ask you just a uh, question straight off the bat and jump straight into the deep end. Mm -hmm. um, how does one leave a mark upon a university? I don't know <laughs> if one <laughs> leaves a mark on a university. Universities have been around for a long time. They continue on. We, the academics, pass through them. We try to make a mark on our research field. And I think you could say that we make a continuing mark through the students we, we teach. Uh, but whether we make it a mark on the university, I'm not sure. Hmm. Take my example. I came to the ANU in 1975, which means I've been around this university for going on 38 years. And um, I remember very clearly when I was offered the position, I had come earlier and I was offered the job, and um, the then director of the Research School of Pacific Studies, uh, Tony Lowe, who later became uh, vice chancellor, invited me into his office after the whole process and said what he wanted me to do when I came to the ANU was to develop Indonesian studies, particularly Indonesian anthropology. I think I did that. Uh, we had a huge development of uh, Indonesian studies. It was what already attracted me to the ANU, but it was, uh, I think, certainly from the 80s onwards, uh, ANU became known for as an area of Indonesian studies. Now, in the course of developing that field of study um, and uh, training students and PhD students primarily. Um, I, I devoted a lot of time to, you know, the institution, uh, Research School of, of Pacific Studies then became the Research School of Pacific and Asian Studies. Um, and you could say that that's the institution within the ANU in which I concentrated my efforts. Then I was uh, appointed director of the research school in, in 99, and I served until February of 2006. Well, within three years of, of that, by 2009, um, there was no more research school. The, it had been um, subsumed and transformed in the process of the development of the ANU. I think, personally, I think that was a disaster, uh, but uh, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. um, so it isn't, given the continuous change that universities go through, um, even aspiring to leave your mark on the university, I think is, is vain. It's, mm. it's a vain hope. Huh? So having a plaque uh, stuck somewhere around the university is what, not really of any use considering that it is in such flux? Well, having a plaque is probably very nice. <laughs> um, walk around the university and look at all the plaques, uh, the little monuments and whatnot. And I dare anyone to <laughs> explain what mark that individual huh, actually made on the university. They were here for a time. They did uh, a credible job. Uh, they promoted the ANU. They promoted scholarship. Um, but whether there is something distinctive that you can attribute to a particular individual, that's rare. Mm. That's rare. Okay. Well, perhaps could we talk about uh, what attracted you to ANU, uh, firstly in 1975, or okay. perhaps who attracted you as well? Well, uh, my situation was, was this. I was 
at that time at Harvard. Um, and um, I was then, you could say, being groomed for tenure. I was told that the whole process was underway. And I would have been a very young, tenured professor at Harvard, which in some ways is very attractive. However, um, Australia interested me. Uh, there was a key figure in that, uh, Professor Derek Freeman, who went out of his way to first to attract me here, uh, to interest me in the possibilities of working at the ANU. Um, and he had, uh, like um, uh, Tony Lowe, the idea that it was critical to develop Indonesian anthropology um, in, 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 the de in the Department of Anthropology and in the research school. And um, I came to Australia and I fell in love. I love the place. Uh, Harvard was attractive, but I knew Harvard very well. And we're going through this funny Harvard ritual I remember going to in to see Dean, Dean Rosowski, a very, very powerful figure at that time. And we talked about this whole tenure process. And when I finished that, I was given by his secretary a ring of keys. It's a curious ring of keys. And these were keys to um, houses in the north part of Cambridge, or mainly in the north part of Cambridge. Old houses, some hundreds of years old, older. And the idea was that you wander around. These are the ones that were unoccupied but were available to Harvard faculty to purchase. And so uh, the idea of, of you know, being at Harvard, you were also buying into the real estate and you, you had a custodian role in maintaining some of these historical places or if, if you wanted to, I mean, you no, ob no obligation. So you had a kind of attraction between the young and the old. Mm -hmm. And Australia, it seemed to me, was hugely attractive. The possibility of a research position, this was a research position, the possibility of being on Indonesia's doorstep. At that time I was working primarily in eastern Indonesia, which meant it was even closer. You were, you know, a short flight from Darwin to, say, Kupang, where near my field sites. Um, so all of that was extremely attractive. So I made the jump, uh, brought the family here, and I think it's, it's the best decision I ever made in my life. Hmm. Sounds good. Yeah, now, Anthony Forge was another man that attracted you to this. Anthony, yes, yes, Anthony was part of the equation. Um, what had happened was that we, Anthony and I had um, contributed to a conference in England. As it happened, I, I contributed a paper, but wasn't able to attend. Um, but uh, passing through Bali on my way to field work in eastern Indonesia, um, um, Anthony was there beginning field work on Bali. Um, this was probably 72, 73. And he, uh, he was there with his family, and we got together, and we spent almost two weeks our families together in Sanor. This is a time before the great tourist blossoming in, in Bali. We had a marvelous time. Our kids were almost the same age, um, and we got together. Now, it was during that period, while he was on Bali, that Anthony Forge was invited to become the foundation professor in the faculties, foundation professor of anthropology. So. Um, he then went back to England and then came to Australia. So he was here. He was another attraction. Um, and so it wasn't simply Derek Freeman, but uh, Anthony was there. And um, um, he was also um, pretty convincing. Another person who was here already was someone 
uh, Roger Keesing. Uh, Roger Keesing had been hired as a professor of anthropology uh, in, with Derek Freeman, and Roger was someone whom I knew as a graduate student. Um, I was an undergraduate, he was a graduate student at Harvard, but uh, I'd gotten to know him then. And it's possible that he's the one who suggested to Derek Freeman um, to contact me, because the contact came from, originally came from Derek. Hmm. So, uh, and it was a good move. For me, it was a very, very good move. Uh, uh, of course, a life-changing uh, move, but uh, a very, very good one, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so a good move for your anthropological studies. Uh, uh, superb, yeah. So could you describe to us the, the university as you found it a bit more? You said it was an ideal situation. Okay, well, no, it's almost paradise. That, um, <laughs> when I arrived, you realize coming from Harvard, you're coming from a very different formal situation. Um, so there was a certain element of uh, less formal arrangements. But a um, couple things that, that struck me as unusual. Um, the first of those, and it's, it's, it's a small thing, and it, but it's more than terminology. There were no students. Everyone who was doing a PhD in the research school was called a research scholar. And they were part of the continuing research program of the department. Um, they fitted in there. They were as vital to the research program as some of the senior people. So you had a situation then where um, you had research scholars and then you had fellows, and these fellows were on short-term appointments, usually up to, but not always up to, five years. So there was a continuous turnover of, of academics, um, shifting, shifting as, as the research programs developed. Um, and then you had a relatively, compared say, to the Harvard Department, a relatively small staff. Um, Derek Freeman and Roger Keesing were professor. I was a uh, professorial fellow, and then there were some senior fellows, Mari Ray, uh, Gayan Wijewardena, and eventually appointed to senior fellow, uh, Michael Young. So it was a relatively small, small group. They had permanent positions. There were then the temporary positions, and, you had the, and then you had the research. Now, one of the things, um, if you, coming from the, the U.S., uh, one of the major concerns was always applying for grants, and, and one had to do that regularly. Here, when I arrived, of course, we had a block grant, and we had a research allocation. And I remember sitting down the first, first time we had the meeting to discuss the research budget, um, the whole thing was worked out and in, in, in allocated um, in a matter of, well, less than an hour. Uh, highest priority were for the research scholars who were doing field work, and then it sort of moved up depending on your particular research needs. Uh, but it wasn't huge amounts of money, but it was sufficient to get on with research. So you had that. The next thing, and probably in terms of the original conception of the research school, was the idea, the idea that you could embark on long-term research. It wasn't that you were writing a grant for a year or two and you had to rush that through and get your publications out and get that done and then jump on to another one. You had, you could plan long-term. One of the things I planned and worked out, and in fact fashioned, was a program for the study of Eastern Indonesia. And so probably in total, over, over the time I was in the department, I was able to um, supervise, direct um, about a dozen students all of whom were working on societies that had never before been studied in Eastern Indonesia. So Clifford Gertz once said to me, he said, well, Eastern Indonesia is the black hole of, of anthropology. Well, we, we 
fashioned out, we cleared that, we made it one of the most prominent areas for research. Mm -hmm. And the research school, uh, anthropology there became known for that. Um, we, a little later, embarked on a program of what I, which I headed was what was called the Comparative Austronesian Project. And this was an attempt to look at the whole of uh, the Austronesian speaking world and to look at it comparatively. And that's a project that produced oh, at least a half dozen books. Um, it officially ended, the funding ended, the group uh, dispersed um, because there was a group hired just for that. We had five positions hired to, to be filled for that, uh, but then the group dispersed. But publications are continuing mm. in, that, in that area. Um, we're planning the next, the continuation of the Comparative Austronesian project. Um, just on talking about uh, publications, could we talk a little bit, just to interject, could we talk a little bit about your work with the E-Press? Yeah, well, okay, l let's talk about the E-Press a little further on, if, okay. if, you, if you don't mind, because I think the E-Press is a very important thing that's worth talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and the Comparative Austronesian Project volumes are now published through the E-Press. Uh, but the E-Press comes um, much later, much later in the sort of development, say, of the ANU. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, one of the things, what's interesting is that some of the projects that I'm now trying to finish are in fact projects that I initiated back in um, back in, at, in the early time when I when I was um, uh, first came to the ANU. So that there was another I think very special capacity to be able to carry on long-term research. Now. Um, there was, I thought, even within the research school, the research school was, uh, had its own system of governance, a faculty board, a director and a faculty board. The faculty board, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't put on the faculty board for many years, you know, being junior, but eventually I was on the faculty board. And you realize that there was a system of collegial governance. And, and I think, that also helped to shape the ANU because you had different, you had different disciplines, and you had to coordinate things. Um, the fact that there were different disciplines meant that you didn't stay within just one area of research. You had historians telling you about things. You had linguists. I worked a lot with the linguists. You had um, you had the economists. At times, I was working with the economists. Um, so there was, there was a special collegiality uh, that I felt um, and, and, I, and, and, and which made, I thought, the research school very distinct. Mm -hmm. One last thing, and that is also something, it's, it's very hard to say exactly when it changed, but um, in the initial years, in the research school, we were occasionally called on uh, to provide some advice to government. Okay, that's fine. Um, but initially, there was this was a kind of a service and expected of someone who was in the research school. But eventually, as time went on, um, the idea of consultancies came in. Consultancies are in anthropology, in economics, in geography, in resource management, in a lot of these fields, consultancies now take up a lot of time. Uh, I'm not saying they're distraction, they're very important. Um, but there is also a whole lot of contracts you have to write to get these, get these set up. Um, it's, it changes the nature. The, what the university decreed, and I, and I don't remember what year they established it, they established something called the 52-day rule. And the 52-day rule um, said, in effect, that every member of staff has 52 free days. And those days can be uh, allocated for consultancies outside of the normal academic. 
Now that's, that's something that grew as part of the changing university. Um, most every element uh, uh, that one first encountered in the, the research school when I, when I arrived has now been melded and changed. Um, and if you were to tell some of our young, our, our junior faculty about what it was like when you were their age, they'd hardly believe it. <laughs> it's, it's a different place. Mm. So could you describe also then uh, uh, the situation that you inherited um, when you became director of the research school? Okay, okay. Um, let's see, I was appointed as acting director. Um, I was appointed as acting director in 1999. Um, we were in a bit of a crisis. I don't have to go into details about that, but uh, our, the previous director, uh, my predecessor, uh, Merle Rickliffs, resigned to take up a position at Melbourne University. So I stepped into it. And um, the first and foremost problem uh, was a problem in that a certain section of the of the research school of uh, wanted to secede and form something called APSEM, uh, the Asia Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific, uh, something or other. Uh, but it was a school of e uh, of economics and management. Okay, and it was it was largely uh, economics driven, um, and they wanted to develop a different model. Um, APSEM over many transformations became the Crawford School. Mm. Um, but one had to deal with and negotiate uh, what elements stayed within the research school, what elements left. Um, now, as it turned out, I think because of long-standing collegiality, the, the, the main mover for this was Ross, Ross Garneau. Um, and uh, Ross and I, I've, I remember quite clearly, we sat down in my office and we worked out this, that, and the other thing, a modus vivendi. I think it was not problematic. Um, and we were able to solve that problem, uh, or at least alleviate most of the tensions in that problem. APSOM had already been established. Um, thereafter, we had a a budget deficit. I remember that very clearly and being lectured about how you have to deal with budget deficits. Um, so I think in the first year was was really just repair, uh, setting up setting up systems. Um, I changed the, the budgetary the way budgets worked. I changed the way the appointments were made. We had a very complicated system of appointments where appointment would come vacant, for example, in, in international relations, and then the next one to get an appointment might be in geography. So you had this, and, and, and we, we put an end to that and said everyone has their establishment uh, of positions, and if you want to have more positions, you earn more money. I changed budgeting. We had at that time, it's madness to think about it, but at that time um, you had to finish your budget by the end of the year, and if you didn't, you couldn't carry it across. It all reverted back to the school. So everyone went into November, December were mad times for spending money or doing things that ended that everyone could continue with their budget and carry it over to the next year, which meant there was an incentive to save and plan and whatnot. So we did that. And um, then, within about a year, we went into the, uh, the national system. This was part of a major change at the ANU, whereby the research schools all gave up roughly 20-some percent of their budget back to the national system. In turn, they were able to go into the national system. The funding model changed, but also the ability to apply for ARC grants. Um, that was part of the major change that occurred. 
And so uh, I was involved in, in seeing the research school go into the national system and going into the ARC uh, application process. We did it in stages. We were stunningly successful. Um, initially, uh, it was it was it was it was very gratifying to see that. So that um, that was another um, uh, another thing that one did huh, in this you know in this transition period. Uh, one of the things I tried to do as director. Um, was what I called walkabout. Mm -hmm. And every couple days I would tell my secretary, okay, time, I'm going to walk about. And I'd wander around the corridors in the Coombs building, knocking on doors, meeting people whom, whom you know, especially the junior faculty that we, we, had, we had hired, uh, finding out what their research was like, what was going on. Um, I tried to get a sense of, of you know, what, what people were doing. Huh? and why it was important, why they were motivated to do what they were doing. So uh, there was this other process of bringing in the new renewal process for the research school. At the same time, the renewal process meant that you had to um, get our senior faculty to retire more or less on time. This was a time when the age limit for retirement had been dropped. So we set up a special emeritus scheme whereby people could continue to get some funding from the school if they retired and they still have a place within the reschool. Uh, keeping, keeping the best and, the, and well, keeping as many as we could of our emeritus faculty as active as possible, but with not necessarily allowing that to block the appointment of junior faculty coming on. And, and, and that Thanks again, I think, to the collegiality among, uh, within the school. That worked very, very well. Um, another thing, because you asked about it, but I think it was, it was actually a very important um, development, was the development of the e-press. But that came about um, in a backhanded way. Mm. We had first, um, uh, we had first, in, our, in the school had decided to set up our own press. And we set that, the, it was called Pandanus Press. And the idea was it was going to be a mixed press so that we'd publish a lot on Asia Pacific, but we'd publish other things that would, would earn money to pay for the academics. Well, it didn't work that way. Um, it turned out to be a very serious drain on finances running that press and publishing the books and keeping the stock and doing all of those, those, those things. So um, we were looking around for another model and I wanted to go towards e-publishing for Pandanus, but I wanted to go towards uh, uh, an ANU e-publishing. Um, but I became involved very much with Colin Steele, the then librarian, and the two of us um, conceived of the e-press in sort of outline form. We persuaded Ian Chubb that there is nothing that says more about a university than its press, and that were he to provide the initial grant to set up an e-press, we would then begin publishing, but we would publishing free for download. So it was a very different model. It was a model also where we wanted to have as many different editorial committees, so it was decentralized. And the editorial committees, not some syndic at the top, decided what we published. It was decided at the, at the research level what was published, and that was fed up to the e-press the e that simply carried out the task of publishing. And I, I think the e-press, if there is one thing that, that continues from that, from that period, it was we, we conceived of it in 2000. It was cooking in 2001. It was developed in 2002. It began in 2003, and it's continuing. So that's one of the continuing institutions that came out of all of this. So, yeah. Okay. So now that we've gone through uh, 
uh, your time here at ANU. Um, can we talk briefly about perhaps you becoming appointed to the chair position of the emeritus faculty? Oh, okay, okay. Well, that's that's um, a recent development. Um, mm -hmm. I was deputy um, last year, and uh, in December uh, last year, I was yeah appointed. I mean, there is a vote, but in fact, it's. Um, I think I was the only one standing for uh, for chair or whatever it's. I don't know whether it's called chair or president or whatever it is. Anyway, uh, the emeritus faculty is again an institution um, that was originally established by John Maloney, Professor John Maloney, um, over ten years ago. Um, we have now moved to new a new building. Um, we attempt um, to create or maintain the collegiality um, of, among ourselves, among the faculty. Um, we, I suppose, see ourselves to some extent as the keepers of the memory of the university um, and, and, of course, the values of the university. Um, I have various plans for this coming year. I want to establish a series that will focus on ANU research. Um, and I want to, um, you know, begin organizing more events for our emeritus faculty, draw more people into the emeritus faculty. Um, but again, it's one of these institutions started in one way and continuing to develop. We'll see how it works. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, your time here, um, you've, you've gone through many different stages. Um, would you see yourself as moving through the university body? Um, would you see yourself in the role of a consolidator or an innovator? Mm, I, I'm not sure... I'm certainly not a consolidator, but whether I'm an innovator, I, 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 I have operated within the university. I've operated within the university, um, and I have, um, say, gone with the flow. Uh, one has to. Uh, one has to um, uh, continue continue to develop the university in the way uh, one sees as the most appropriate at the time. Now, within the university, one aspect um, has been absolutely central for me uh, within this, you know, within this framework, and that has been uh, PhD training. I mean, that was at the essence of uh, the, the original research school, PhDs were uh, uh, the focus. Um, so I've supervised a lot of PhD students. I've supervised, as I said before, I've supervised a lot of s PhD students doing work on um, Eastern Indonesia. Um, very early on, in fact, when I arrived, the first students I had at the ANU were both Javanese. I had no good, I, I'd been to Java, of course, but I had no idea of that as a research area. But those students sort of shifted my interest to Java. And in the 80s, I began a second area of field research in Java. Um, very good, it was very exciting. and. Um, in the course of time, I then began training students to research, to do research on Java, and a lot of Javanese doing research on Java. So I suspect if we counted them up, I had probably trained more students working on Java than in Eastern Indonesia. But those were the two main foci of my, uh, my thing. But it's within, within the university, giving priority uh, to those students because in the end they are the ones who are productive. So I mean they, they, are, they are the ones who 
carry on your research huh, and do the dozens and dozens of things that you, huh, you yourself cannot do personally or physically or whatever. Okay, Jim, well, um, it's been a lovely conversation. Uh, I'd like to thank you uh, very warmly for your, your time that you've given us. And um, I hope that we can chat a bit further in the future. Good. Thank you. I always like to talk. <laughs>